Anything is possible. New freezer has a lot of them. We did it. Yes. Boom. Adam, how are you, man? Two tech geniuses right here. I love it. I'm good. How you doing? I'm great. Happy Friday. Thanks for joining us. Same to you, man. Thanks for having me. Of course. Of course. Uh, you coming in from New York? I am. Yeah. So apologize for like the drilling and the police sirens that are, are likely to happen in my building. It's all right. You'll hear them from us as well over here in LA. So yeah, no perfect. problem at all. Well, uh, Adam, thanks for joining, guys. This is episode 25. We've got Adam Brown from Circle Media, um, one of my favorite personalities on LinkedIn, entrepreneurs, monster in the game of digital marketing. Really excited to chat today. So uh, thanks for coming on, dude. Thanks for having me. I appreciate that intro. I'm yeah, a big of fan course. of yours, too. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's, uh, dude, just want to start high level. Um, you know, I will say you put out incredible content, um, but how, you know, where, where are you from? How did you get started? And uh, how did you eventually make it into creating your own agency? Um, I'm from New York, uh, Yankees represent, and uh, I've lived in New York my whole life other than Ann Arbor for four years. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 43, so I graduated college in 99 during the dot-com boom. And uh, I went to law school for 29 days, and I realized that was not for me. <laughs> Dropped out, uh, joined one of these, uh, one of the thousands of uh, dot com companies, and um, I, my first salary, I started December first, so we're coming up on it, nineteen ninety nine. First salary, twenty three thousand uh, dollars, not enough to live in New York on that budget. So, fast forward, uh, you know, I knew I wanted at some point to own my own company. I didn't want to uh, a like work my way up in the advertising world, going up incrementally like five thousand dollars every year until I, you know. And uh, I wanted to just control my own destiny. So I sort of like pinned that I definitely want to start my own company at some point. I was in the mortgage business for like a decade. So I was on the client side. We had a big company. We did a lot of marketing. Like we spent two million a month in marketing. So we did television, radio, like everything you could imagine. And I would, I would constantly get pitched by, you know, guys in their 20s and oversized suits that had sales jobs that had no idea what they were talking about. And they would sell me. SEO and SEM and all this stuff. And some of them were probably legit, but they didn't work. Some were shysters because that was like a hot business in the 2000s. Yeah. And I was just like, you know what? I have to start my own company and I have to start a company in the marketing and services space that actually delivers four season service and actually acts like a client. Cause I don't think anyone does it. I think most agencies suck. So the nugget was build an agency that gives you off the chart service uh, specifically built for small businesses. So that was like, that's the clip note version of how I got from there to here. That's awesome. And, and I guess here, I, I love talking about the dot com boom and bust. Can you share your experience with, you know, I think there's a similar trend happening. Obviously, you know, there are waves of these booms and busts. But can you can you talk to me a little bit about what marketing looked like during that dot com boom and bust? I mean, when you had pets.com, you have every dot com you can imagine. Versus now, you know, we had this wave of D to C brands, you got emerging food and beverage brands, a new brand is launching every day. Can you talk a little bit about the parallels between those two? Yeah, so I actually worked at a company called 24 seven media. So we actually mm -hmm. represented 5000 websites, and we were hired to sell the advertising for those 5000 websites. So you can there imagine, you I was selling advertising for all these different domains, trying to get brands to work with us. And it was a good time. I started in uh, 99 and by the time i left in december of 2000 uh my stock strike price was 64 dollars day one it was like 37 cents the day i left it went to like zero Damn. all these companies went out of business and there's a parallel to now in the sense that kids that were graduating from college when i left michigan came to new york and it was like dude dot com there's there's so many awesome jobs and there's parties every night and everything is flush and there's money everywhere it was a good time in new york very similar to like CPG beverage or just, yep. or even just like entrepreneur, like, like the last few years, like everything's hot, everything's dope, everything's great. And now this like harsh reality is a very strong parallel to then, right? It's all of a sudden, like all these people out of business, a lot of CPG and beverage brands, like folding up, not getting anywhere. Pandemic hits, everyone's on freeze, everyone's shook, everyone's trying to figure out what the hell to do. And it was similar then, like everyone was licking their wounds, figuring out what, what is online, is online a fad, is it going to go away? are things going to change? And a lot of people in that space ended up going to work at like banks or mortgage companies or different types of things. They had to like reinvent themselves. 
And I think there's going to be a lot of that like right now, specifically on marketing. It used to be like, hell yeah, man, you could market everywhere. You could market on Lycos or Earthlink or whatever, MapQuest or things like that. Now it's kind of like Facebook, Instagram, you know, Amazon, Google, like there's not that many platforms. Uh, so it's gotten a little bit more simple. If you can find experts for those platforms, you can do really well from a marketing point of view. Back then it was kind of like Wild West. Yeah, so like where, let's say some of your top clients, or maybe you even have a campaign that was really memorable to you. So the same way that like a brand like ours would go, you know, focus on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn. How, what was the, the, the comp? Was it banner ads, uh, outdoor advertising? Like what, what were you guys spending money on? Dude, I, I, well, I, at that time, I'm talking about when I was working in the business, so I was selling, mm. not, not buying. Mm. I, I sold a campaign to Rand McNally. I don't even know if that, it, that was like a hundred year old company. I don't even know if it's around anymore. Like they made the maps. They made like the book map that your parents would have in their car. Got it. I cold called them on the phone, like grinding cold calling, got them on the phone and sold them as a 22 year old. And uh, they bought like a campaign. They bought, we represented goto.com, which was the first pay-per-click search engine. So this predates Google. So a lot of people watching this are going to realize how old I am. Predating <laughs> Google, legit, sold a pay-per-click search engine. And I'm like, oh my God, this search engine pay-per-click is the best thing. Called goto. I was like, I love what you're up to. They hired me, stole me away from 24-7 media, which they weren't supposed to do. And they made me the head of Northeast sales literally in the end of 2000, 2001. And I just went out and sold that product like crazy. It was literally like, hey, Dell computers, when somebody is interested in a laptop, don't you want to be first? And then it was like, click, hey, Compaq, wouldn't you want to bid a cent more and be ahead of them? And, and like, literally, and it was a great time to be in sales because you could just sell everyone that just wanted to outbid their competition. Um, so that was like a hot, that was a hot tip back then, pay-per-click search engine marketing. I was, I was like a pioneer on that. That's, I mean, that's amazing. And, and do you do a lot of that now? Like, are you pretty focused on SEO or do you think that there's some fatigue uh, with, with that kind of marketing or maybe the market's just saturated or kind of flat? Yeah, so I don't, I don't really, we, we don't do anything in SEO and SEM. I'm just also not a big believer in it. I think the best SEO is on-site content. So committing to like putting on-site content, writing relevant content, putting it out there, having things that people are interested in. Uh, we spend, when we're talking about advertising dollars, for our clients, Facebook, Instagram, primarily, we dabble a little bit on, you know, Snap and TikTok and those kind of things, but it's primarily Facebook and Instagram. And I'm also, the whole reason I created this agency, which is uh, helpful and maybe helpful to, I don't know, the, the audience here, but to help, to help give some value. Um, I build it bottom up. I'm very, I was on the client side for 10 years, so I very much understand the client. So rather than smoke and mirrors, SEO and all these things, because a lot of these guys, I think like, they're like, I'm going to say SEO. The guy's not going to understand half of what I'm saying yep. and they're going to shell over $2,000 a month and I'm going to tell them they need to give me six months before they see any results and people do it and they do it over and over. I'm the opposite. I'm like, I got to think like a client. I got to reverse engineer what I want to have happen. I want to hear and I'm a good salesperson so I can smoke out a fake and, at any second so I can listen to somebody and realize, do they have value? Does this have value? Can I do this on my own? And so I, I recommend to the brands I work with, like, where can you be scrappy and figure out the things you actually can do on your own? There's, there's a lot you can't, so then you have to have experts. But there's certain things you can, and SEO is one of those things that you can probably find someone at Upwork cheap just to get you set up, and then get the playbook, and then get someone on your team, or an intern that's like a, you know, getting credit as a writer uh, in food and beverage, especially in this business, and just have them like pump out just dope content for your site, and now you could save all that money on SEO and put it to Facebook ads. I think that makes so much sense and I completely agree with you. There's another thing that you constantly champion that I fully am aligned with is I see a lot of founders that are not living in their social media platforms. Like for me, man, I'm in every single platform to an extent where I bother, uh, you know, our, our, our marketing lead and he, he gets annoyed with me. But like you cannot just yet yeah, there, there's there's a, a, a strategy and a playbook for this. Now, I also think a founder and an, an internal team can only do so much. And I do think there are great agencies like yourself who have basically who put fuel on the fire. Now I do, I've also personally had bad experiences with where I've hired an agency and I've been told that X, Y, or Z was going to happen. You think you're going to outsource something. And then you're like, man, if I just got in there and started creating content, really understanding the metrics that the organic impressions, what I can really accomplish, is it really worth it to pay that retainer? 
And, and, and I think that because there are so many bad actors, it, it oftentimes, I'm not going to lie, I don't love agencies. Um, yeah. But there are the few that shine through because I see how much time, effort, and empathy you have for actual founders. So just, just something on the side. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can jump into a lot of the things there. Um, it's why I started this company. Most agencies suck. Most agencies are shysters. Um, they just are. So, you know, one of like the, there's three, there's three legs to the chair of why Circle exists. One of those legs is why do agencies have to suck? Why do they have to have this broken business model? And just like all these people come in and disrupt the ice cream model or the cereal model, I'm disrupting the agency model. Like I'm joining your team. Like I'm a board member. Like the guys at Jupiter just hired me. They, they both are Michigan guys and they hired me. They're like, we just feel like you're one of our, you're like the third co-founder. Like, let's yeah. go. And I'm like, yeah, that, go. That, that's exactly how it should be. And then to your point, you got to be in it. Because when you're not in it, that's how agencies rook you. They're like, well, David doesn't know anything about Facebook ads, so we can trick him. You should be in it enough that you're like, show me what you're doing. Have a defendable reason why it's working or not. And tell me what you're doing instead. And a lot of agencies can't. And they don't like when the clients call. They always say the, the agency model is get them on retainer, hope and pray they never call. That's the PR model. Get them at the $10,000 retainer, get them a couple of hits. Don't tell them what to do with it. Just get them the hits. And then you pray 30 days go by and they don't call you, right? Yep. I'm the opposite. Yep. I want to be called. I want to be challenged. I want to jam. I want to do these kind of things so I can get ideas <laughs> out there so I can see what I do actually yield results. I love it. I love it. So let's, let's take a step back. You're at GoTo. Uh, you're enjoying it. It's like, you know, dot com boom. How do you make it over to Grub Life? And then eventually, how do you end up starting Circle? So in the middle there was literally nine and a half years working at a mortgage bank, um, running sales and marketing for a big company. At our, at our max, we had 1,000 employees. We probably averaged like 600. So I got insane MBA, like client side experience, but I hated the industry. It was just not for me. I did not want yeah. to be in that business. And so uh, we lost our FHA lending license, as did 11,000 mortgage banks and brokers in, in 2009, 10. And I was like, I'm out. And so I wasn't like wallowing it. I'm like, dude, I'm, thank God. Otherwise, I could maybe still be in that business. I'm like, I'm out. And what's a business that I think I can over-index on sales and marketing? And that's how I came up with Grub Life. It was Groupon for college. At that time, Groupon and Living Social were the freaking hottest things going. And I'm like, why is there no model for college? This is crazy. So I literally like hired a Ruby on Rails developer, copied the Groupon website, build, built Grub Life, launched at the University of Michigan on September 3rd, 2010, went to Ann Arbor, sold 100 businesses in one weekend, just walking door to door and being like, hey, what's up, Nick? I used to eat here handy years ago. You should run a deal, $10 for $20 worth of food. Uh, and uh, we did that for a while. It was fun. It was self-funded with me and my brother. It was a big cash burn. It was a very expensive to launch each school. And as we were doing it, Groupon and Living Social models were getting weird. Businesses were blowing up. Like it was like not good for business. And again, it felt a and I think that model has merit, but it felt a little close to the mortgage business. And the mortgage business has merit, but it, again, it felt like it felt more icky than good for me. So for me, I'm like, I got to do something I can get up every morning, be proud of and like feel like it's great. So I'm like, let's go back. Agency model. What's hot? I had not been on Facebook, not ever seen Facebook once until until late September of 2010. So I was wow. late to the game. I just went on and I was like, I'm an old dude, right? I wasn't on Facebook. I didn't know that. <laughs> I got on Facebook. I learned it. I'm like, holy cow, this is this is amazing. Twitter. And then I heard about Gary Vaynerchuk and I like followed him and I saw what he did. And I'm like, this can explode in a good way, small businesses. Look what he did with his wine business. Look, I was like, this is where I can do it because small businesses are never gonna figure out social media because it's very, it's ever changing. It's not static. And so it's not one of those things that you like get to the top of the mountain and you figure out because as soon as you do, TikTok comes out and then you figure out TikTok and Reels comes out and you figure out like, so you're yep. always chasing. And if you're a small business owner, you have to run a business. You can't be always chasing marketing. So the, the light bulb went off for me. I hung up, I created Circle Media, stands for Social Circle Circle, made a logo, off to the races, and then started pitching small businesses. And who is your first client? Um, that's a hell of a question. Uh, well, so actually in the middle there, I started a company called Social Net Direct. And I was like, okay. all right, I can go to small, really small businesses, like dry mm -hmm. cleaners and like diners. 
and I can sell them a 199 package where I set up their Facebook, their Twitter, and I don't even know, it was like three platforms set up and I just like set them up and got them online and then $99 a month on a recurring revenue model because I figured that's the business I want to be in. And I did that for a bunch of brands. So I had a bunch of little companies and again, nice. I felt terrible because everyone hated it. My first yeah. big client was Alex Toys. It's a big toy company, which ultimately, it's like Melissa and Doug and Alex Toys were like the two big players. It ended up selling to a private equity firm years later, but they were like our first like brand that we landed. It's awesome. I mean, dude, I, I've looked at your client list. It's, it's unbelievable, you know, A-list clients. You're obviously doing something right. Um, as you, you started with, you know, some of these smaller businesses, you started to transition. How did you start moving really and specializing in, in CPG and food and beverage? So uh, two things. One, um, I started realizing that while it's vertical agnostic and while I think I can give really good social strategy to any business, I was like, my secret sauce and what works, it definitely, I'm definitely a product guy, not a service. And I'm definitely B2C, not B2B. So right, right away, I got rid of like a lot of old clients. Then it was like, you know what? Again, as, my, as the Adam Brown rebirth from the mortgage industry, I gotta be, I gotta do, I'm a good salesman and a good marketer, but I'm a better sell, salesman and marketer for something I really believe in. And there so C, CPG, beverage and spirits are the kind of things that I like to consume and put on my body. So I'm like, all right, I take my secret sauce. I take a category of the kind of things I like to eat and consume anyway. I'm a buyer, I'm a consumer. So I can get in that mindset. And I just sort of honed in on that really for like the last two, almost three years. It's awesome. It's awesome. And uh, okay, so circles growing, it's expanding. I think one question I've got for you is, you've made a couple career changes, technology, you know, tech startup, uh, you're in the mortgage business, uh, you know, agency model, how were you dealing with I mean, I've only done a career shift twice to do it multiple times to have the confidence and not listen to the bullshit and the noise of people's opinions. I mean, dude, when I quit, I was I was in eye banking when I quit my job to go sell popsicles. For the first 24 months, I was like laughed out. Like people did not get it. It was like a joke. Like it was ridiculous. I'm so sure. like, how do you deal with the, you know, multiple career pivots? I have so much admiration for that. How, how did, you know, your family respond? How were people responding? And how did you kind of push through uh, and find your kind of true north? So I'll start, I'll start backwards. You know, I don't, I have like super crazy Tom Brady, like, robot mentality. So I, I literally don't dwell at like at all on any kind of like anxiety, depression, negative at all. I like dust off negative, I go back with the positive. And I think it's because I've just been in sales since like, since I was in high school. So I can deal with no's, I can deal with rejection, and I don't really care. So it doesn't really matter. I'm sure there were people that were like, chirping, but I never really thought thought of it that way. Um, I know generally topic like this, this, this series that you do, and, and the nature of probably this audience is like, you know, do you, did you always want to be an entrepreneur and how are you doing that? When I was an, when I was younger, entrepreneur was like a real like loser title for sure. Um, it was like somebody who can't hack it, who keeps jumping around. So the answer to your question is, I don't think that was ever the case. Like I've been successful, knock on wood, wherever I've gone. So it wasn't like, oh, he, he opened three hot dog stands and he couldn't do that. So now he's in like a tech bi uh, painting business and that he couldn't do that. It's more like, no, I was in the mortgage business. I probably would have done it forever, but my business lost its license. And I was like, thank God I got out of it. I tried Groupon, didn't work. And I got into this and I'll do this for a very long time. This is ever going. I don't, this is like where I'm hanging my hat. I'm also, I'd like to invest more and get more involved on a board level with businesses, but now I can really uh, escalate. And the truth is you build on your experiences. You built on your iBanking experience to be the smart guy you are in this business. There's a lot of guys in your spot that have no idea what they're talking about with that. So you, you started on second base when it came to anything around finances for your business, right? So same is true here. They're all building blocks. They seem different, but it's always sort of been sales, marketing, and ownership. You know, I hate to like bring up like a super trite Steve Jobs quote, but there really is that beauty of looking back and connecting the dots. There's so much that flows through my past experiences as well that you look into what we're building today. Sure, it sounds like the exact same with you. Um, it's awesome, man. I mean, I love it. I think in order to really... Here, here's the problem. The, the industry, CPG in general, has gotten, it's become glamorous and sexy, and a lot of people want to be in it because food is fun. But the reality of the situation is, is this is arguably like one of the harder spaces you could pick. It requires a ton of capital, it's insanely competitive. Um, so, with that in mind, you know, what tips or advice would you have for people? Dude, you're an investor in multiple businesses, you've seen a ton of marketing strategies, and probably under the hood of 
50, hundreds of food and beverage brands. What tips or advice would you have for people who are seriously considering going to build a business in CPG? Uh, have money. There you um, go. Have thick skin. Uh, really believe in it. Like, I think the problem is a lot of people, there's like two ways people get in, right? There's, they are passionate about something and they tinkered around and they like made something and now they got to figure it out and they realize it's a terrible product that can never scale. Um, there's a lot of people doing that and they're like three years in and it's probably never going to go anywhere. And then there's the other guys, like the Magic Spoon guys were like, they were in Cricket Protein and that was rough and no one bought in. They're like, what is a business that is not Cricket Protein? What is universal? that everyone will buy, that we could kill it in. And they went after cereal, and I, I love that. But they have the capital, they have the brain, and they knew that that was a great business that could scale. So if you're thinking about getting in now, which I don't know everyone is, if you're thinking about getting in right now, think about a business that like ships well, maybe not refrigerated and frozen, because those are tough. Um, yeah, hard. You know, <laughs> hard, they're hard, right? Like it's, your product is super dope. I'm drinking a Genius Juice, I love this stuff, but like you had a ship, you know, you, it's, it's expensive. So. There's nuances to it and um, just understand like, if I'm gonna go all in with that kind of a business, I'm gonna have to have, I'm gonna have to be sharp, I'm gonna have to be decisive and I'm gonna have to have dough. Uh, if you went with a less expensive business, you could probably get by a little bit faster on like Amazon and, and e-commerce because it's inexpensive. Um, but I think, I think we're, we're not gonna have this now because of where the economy is going. But like the last few years, you had people that just like got in this game that like had no, they weren't really founders, they weren't really passionate. They were sort of faking it. A lot of these like keto trend guys and like they realize like they don't really have a business. They don't really have a brand and they're becoming like an also ran guy as opposed to like a leader in the space. So I think you have to really believe in what you have. As far as me from an investor, I don't invest a lot. Uh, when I do invest, it's like 90% the founder. So like I invested in uh, Rind with Matt. That guy's a stud. I Matt, with, Mark, I monsters. Mark is a, <laughs> Mar and Mark's a monster. And Mark worked for me in the mortgage business like 15 years ago. That's how I know Mark. And I That's was like, epic. out of 5,000 salespeople that work for me, he was one of the top five, one of the only fifth degree black belts. And again, sales is a really big part of it. You have to sell investors. You have to sell your employees. You have to sell clients. You have to have sales ability. Um, even Alex, who, Bayer, like you wouldn't think he's a salesman. His story is he's a salesman. Right, he doesn't. An amazing seem, story. He doesn't no, amazing seem like story. You're, like your average, he doesn't seem. He doesn't have like the New York energy like me, but he's a salesman and he's super smart. So, founder, product, real brands, those are the uh, elements that you need. And if you don't have those things, you're gonna you're gonna have trouble. Plus, great. I mean, speaking of Alex, when Alex and I did the show, he was literally hitting 500 Publix in the in the car with me while we were doing the interview. He was in the parking lot at a Publix on awesome. his like 130th Publix store of that like few weeks i was like during COVID, i'm like dude you're a monster, monster. unbelievable yeah um i love it dude um okay really really helpful and um let's dive into marketing tips like from from you 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 understand this space what can founders do what can brands do to break through now if they don't have a ton of capital like i'm gonna be frank with you we spend zero dollars on paid marketing so how do you react to that um if when brands are like man i need like Ten thousand, twenty thousand, fifty thousand dollars being spent a month. I don't personally think you need a ton of capital to be a great marketer in twenty twenty. Yeah, so I think you should. I think you shouldn't be romantic about saying that you don't spend any money on paid marketing. You should spend some money on paid marketing. We so, need to. I'm not yeah. saying it's a good. I'm not saying no, it's a good thing. I, know, I just I know. we 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 want it, to. We I, I need to. There's a lot of founders with super sick brands with ninety three thousand followers on Instagram that just have it. Like you have it. Like you have it naturally. So don't let that be like, all right, cool. I have that flow naturally. I don't need the paid. Add the paid on top of it, and you will see it really skyrocket, especially around retail. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a missed opportunity. I, I didn't mean to say it in a, totally. way, in a way like that. I'm more so meant to say a lot of brands I see I think they need to spend a hundred thousand dollars a month to build uh, a significant brand or like a brand, and I, that's more so what I'm. To totally, you know, and I, and I, I was just sort of saying because I think other brands probably feel that way too. Um, it's not easy to catch lightning in the bottle and you've done that quite a bit. Um, but now you should double down on it. And I think 2021 is going to be a good year. We're already seeing CPMs come way down post-election and it's just a really good time to do it. And if you're in refrigerated or frozen, you got to support retail velocity. You're not going to be doing sampling like you used to be. So you got to have that playbook and you got to rinse and repeat around every store that you work with. The buyers are going to want it. So you got to be ready with it. Specifically with tips, if you're super small and have no money, just be scrappy as hell like literally like create a facebook group not a page or have a page but create a group 
join groups. If you're like a little ice cream brand in Cleveland, Ohio, that has like eight stores, join all like the vegan ice cream groups or vegan groups in, in Cleveland. Go to the person that runs the group, send them a free pint, let them try it, let them tell their people about it, do hand deliveries, like hand-to-hand -hand combat. Get your first 100 customers if you have e-commerce, call them on the phone. I told Mark Samuel to do it. He's like, I'm crazy enough, I might do it. I'm like, I know you are. And that's you should, it's that's amazing. What, that would call, totally be a call 100, call 10,000 people, unbelievable. And that like, guy used to cold call as a salesman back in the day. So he's like, dude, I'll take my, I'll do it right now. I'm like, you should, because people will appreciate and it stands out from the clutter from what other people are doing. So I, I posted something on LinkedIn um, this week about like zigging when others zag, like just doing the opposite. So when everybody's going along in one direction, I just like the idea of value in other areas. So hand-to-hand -hand combat, Facebook groups, um, you know, text. I know you, you've been pushing text. I love SMS. Going back to email, I'm, I'm getting better, such, so much more into email these days. Um, spending some on Facebook and Instagram, whatever you got, like using that. Finding influencers that can be romantic about your product, hyper local that can go into retail stores and help you with that narrative. You just got to be able to do that. And I think if you're hungry enough and you have enough flair, you could talk a lot of people into doing a lot of things for you, either free or at very low cost. So I wouldn't outsource and just take the rate card from an influencer or just overpay for Instagram ads like we were talking at the beginning of this call. Like get on early and just be like, listen, influencer, here's my brand. Here's what I'm about. I like if you do that to 10 people, 10, two, three, four will be like, I like you. Let's do it. Send me your product. I'm going to try it. I'll let you know. If you do that every single day, five days a week, that's 100 people that you're contacting. That's 30 potential people that will work with you just because you got on the phone. So these are some t these are just like some small adult ball tips I would recommend rather than just like throwing tons of cash. How about content creation? I mean, you may, you have awesome long form content, short form content. You post on LinkedIn a lot. Um, any tips on where you should be putting out content as a brand right now today? Yeah, I mean, for, for me as a personal brand, for you as a founder, LinkedIn all day, every day. I spend so much time on LinkedIn. It's crazy. Like I'm on there all day. Like I'm like Dude, every with... time I scroll on, man, I see your stuff. It's 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 you, Mark. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, the algorithm <laughs> the algorithm has us <laughs> swimming in the same waters. But um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's free. I can get on there and I I can actually get heard. And even if it's like it, sometimes it'll be like 300 people total. Like it doesn't matter. Like that's the audience I want to speak to. It's really good for me. Um, I like Facebook groups for what Facebook pages used to be. So I think start a group. And even if you get 10 members in there, those 10 people are going to see every single post on Facebook because Facebook's going to make sure groups show up Great. first. So that's like a no brainer. Um, I like long, I like putting out blog content, like write stuff, like LinkedIn thought pieces. It could be thoughts from the founder. It could be like, get deep with David and just like write something about the industry that goes on your site. And then that's SEO, right? So like push that out and people come back to your site. Maybe they stay around a while. Maybe you retarget them. So um, get back to like doing a little bit longer form content, some video, but also some written word, like, you know, a couple hundred words, like not too much. Um, but then I feel like Mark, Mark might be the best at the authentic storytelling every day. It's, it's amazing. I, yeah, I, I not writing. He, he doesn't love to write, but he's, he's a good speaker, man. So he does it constantly so look at the forum that he's built right it's a, it's amazing so it gives you opportunities and at bats and in this in this business it's a very incestuous business like it or, or, or not um and i think most people want other people to win it's not like that in every industry right you know that so it's true in this business true. ask for help you reach out to most founders they're going to help you out right so you know i think it's a really good idea to put out thoughts, put out content, and then go to thought leaders that have already done it in your space. Ask for help, ask for advice. Ask Daniel Lebetsky, not today, because he had a good week, but like yeah. <laughs> Mark, Mark reached out to Daniel Lebetsky a long time ago. He responded right away. My kids went to nursery school with his. I reached out to him a long time ago to contact. He contacted me back five minutes. I think Nick Sharma posted something the other day that like the most successful people respond in under five minutes or something, and everyone killed him on Twitter. You know what? It's true. So I Dude, they're say, still they're still in the platforms responding themselves. That's how and they're that, you know, that big, but doesn't matter. Doesn't that's matter. That's right. So stay the course, um, keep building any, what you're any, doing. And any new any new plat so you mentioned LinkedIn. What do you think about TikTok or any other new platforms you're looking at that excite you? I like Instagram Reels a lot. It's just an, it's a new platform within a platform. I just think you get more rewarded and it's more native, so it feels natural. TikTok always feels to me like I stole my daughter's phone and I'm in the wrong place. Like and she's like, All right, dad, like that's how I feel every time I go on there. So I don't know. It's just tough for brands. Unless you're Chipotle or like a big retailer, I think Walmart and Target do a really good job integrating. But like 
for a brand, it's really hard. I like what you guys do. You guys share this like ethereal or just like, just like cool third party geometric content and you get a lot of views on reels, yep. right? Yep. And that's a sneaky little hack to get awareness and the algorithm juice around your branded stuff. So that's actually a very smart play. So it's about like thinking about the platform and then how can you hack it? And that's a hack for reels, which I love. And TikTok hack is maybe don't try to do it yourself, rely on influencers to actually do the heavy lifting for you. So those are areas that I like. Uh, I'm interested in uh, Instacart advertising. I know that's not what you're really talking about. but No, I was it's, a, it is. It's huge. It's I was huge. on a call with the Cartograph guys the other day, or a, we were on a panel and he spoke before me. So I saw like the last 10 minutes and he started talking about his Instacart product. And I was like, dude, like that is smart. And that is like actually value right now. So I think brands that are selling in retail, there's an attractive part to that. And if you don't have it, you should maybe look into that. Agreed. Agreed. Um, awesome, man. Well, I want to be conscious of your time. I want to wrap on a couple things. Um, where is Circle Media five, ten years from now? Uh, do you guys also want to build brands? Do you want to invest in more brands? Do you want to just continue to scale as like one of the largest agencies in the world? What's what's your kind of mission and, and vision for the company? I'd say all the above. I don't really. I'm not really looking to be like the largest agency in the world. Um, I think uh, I want to build this thing le higher level. Uh, I, have a, I have a VP that runs my day-to-day -day of the company. So I mostly do content. I mostly do business development and I do all the sales. Uh, I can't imagine when I'm ever going to outsource sales. I've outsourced everything else, meaning to my, my employees, but I just want to continue to sell. But I think that selling starts to take a different look and feel where I'm already seeing it going into this year where brands are hiring us for social, maybe content, maybe paid social, whatever. And then they're like, what if I got you like consulting like once a month or once a quarter where you could be like in the room, almost like you were on the board. So I'm not investing, but they're like paying me to attend those conversations. So I really like that for the next couple of years. I think I can add value and that allows me to have more meaningful conversations than just being like the social media guy. So that's probably the next few years, uh, five, 10 years from now. Um, I think uh, probably investing more heavily in brands. And yeah, you would think at some point we'd want to like incubate something and just like run it through our machine. So that could be something we look into also. Awesome. And then just just last question for you too. What, who are your favorite marketers right now in the space? Um, could be like their own agency, could be brands. Who are your favorite marketers? Or like maybe a couple that come to mind. Um, well, personally, I, just, I love Andy Judd. He's the CMO at Yasso. And he's a client of mine. He's just like one of my favorite CMOs. He's just an awesome dude. And he, I think he gets it. Um, I, think, I think what happens with CMOs is um, a lot of them have no idea what they're doing. So they're full of it. And I get it. Like, meaning they, they were like, they built themselves up and they're in their 40s, almost 50s. And they never learned social and digital. So a lot of them are like, you get in with them and you realize they don't know anything. Yep. Or a lot of them are the opposite. They really think they know everything and like they don't let you do anything. So that's tough. I know that's not the question you just asked me, but so that's yeah. why when I, when I see one that stands out, I wanted to give him some love because he's great. Um, I think the best marketers, I just interviewed Matt Britton um, on my podcast. Uh, he, it's coming out like next week. Um, he's one of the, I said, I told him he's on my marketer Mount Rushmore. It's Seth Godin, Gary Vaynerchuk, Matt Britton and Scooter Braun. Those are guys that I Dude. think know consumer behavior and how to market in the now better than anybody. It's a great marketing Mount Rushmore. I love that. Um, epic. And then just a couple favorite brands that you love watching, the content, everything that they're doing right now. I like your stuff, man. Uh, Thank I honestly, you, bro. I honestly, Appreciate I honestly that. do. You didn't pay me to say that, but I really like your stuff. I reference it a lot. Um, and uh, I think you do good work. I keep talking about Aloha in this space. I just like, I just like what they're up to. I just think they're always kind of doing it right. Um, I work with Yum Earth, and they're a competitor of of Smart Suites, but I think those guys have their act together. They just had a nice exit, um, and I've always been a big fan of Kind. Uh, I just think, I think he's like the OG, and uh, I like what they're doing. I like all the success. I think they blazed the trail when it wasn't so easy. Um, and so I'm kind of always a fan of the things they're up to. And, uh, he just posted something today about his team. They had like a stand up comedy zoom. You could just, you could just tell the culture that like oozes from that place. So I really dig that. It's awesome. Adam, you're the man. Thank you so much for making the time. This is so, so valuable for anybody who just wants to understand, uh, you know, the space that you're in, uh, how to build an agency, how to market. 
So I really appreciate your time. As I said, huge fan of yours and, uh, and have a great weekend, man. So thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me, man. You too. Bye. Cheers.